Hello, my name's Thomas Heatherwick. Um, I'm, uh, I have a studio in London that has a particular approach to designing buildings. Uh, when I was growing up, I was exposed to making and craft and materials and invention on a small scale. And I was there looking at the largest scale of buildings and finding that the buildings that were around me and that were being designed and that were there in all the, uh, in the publications that I was seeing was, was felt soulless and cold. And there on the smallest scale, uh, the scale of an earring or a uh, ceramic pot or a musical instrument was a materiality and a soulfulness. And this uh, influenced me. Uh, the first building I built was 20 years ago. And since in the last 20 years, I've developed a studio in London. And sorry, this was my mother, by the way, in her shop, bead shop in London. I, I spent a lot of time counting beads and things like that. I'm just going to show for people who don't know my studio's work a few projects that we've worked on. This is a hospital building. This is a shop for a bag company. This is uh, studios for artists. This is a sculpture made from a million yards of wire and 150,000 glass beads the size of a golf ball. And this is a window display. And this is a pair of cooling towers for an electricity substation next to St Paul's Cathedral in London. And this is a temple in Japan for a Buddhist monk. And this is a cafe by the sea in Britain. And just very quickly, uh, something we've been working on very recently is we were commissioned by the Mayor of London to design a new bus that gave the uh, passenger their freedom again. Because uh, the original Routemaster bus that you, some of you may be familiar with, which had this open platform at the back. In fact, I think all our Routemasters are here in California now, actually. <laughs> but they aren't in London. Um, and uh, so you're, you're stuck on a bus, and the, if the bus is going to um, uh, stop and it's three yards away from the bus stop, you're just a prisoner. But the, the Mayor of London wanted to reintroduce buses with this open platform. Uh, so we've been working uh, with Transport for London, and that organisation hasn't actually been responsible as, as a client for a new bus for 50 years. And so we've been very lucky to have a chance to work. The brief is that the bus should use 40% less energy. So it's, it's got hybrid drive. And we've been working to try to improve, working for everything from the fabric to the uh, format and, and uh, structure and aesthetics. I was going to uh, show four main projects. And this is a, a project for a bridge. And so we were commissioned to design a bridge that would open and opening seemed, I mean, everyone loves opening bridges, but it's quite a, a kind of basic thing. I mean, I think we all stand and watch, but the, the bridges that we saw that opened and closed, it, it I, I don't know if this is, I'm slightly squeamish, but the, um, you, I once saw a photograph of a footballer who was diving for a ball, and as he was diving, someone had stamped on his knee, and it had broken like this. And, um, the, and, and when, then we looked at these kinds of bridges and just couldn't help feeling but that, that it was a beautiful thing that had broken. And so this is in Paddington in London, and it's a very boring bridge, as you can see. It's, it's just steel and timber. And but instead of what it is, our focus was on the way, the way it worked. So we like the idea that the two furthest bits of it would end up kissing each other. Wow. 
we actually had to halve its speed because everyone was too scared when we first did it. So that's a speed it up. A project that we've been working on very recently is to design a new biomass power station. So a power station that uses organic waste material. In the news, the subject of where our future water is going to come from and where our future power is going to come from is in all the papers all the time. And we used to be quite proud of the way we generated power. Um, but recently, any uh, annual report of a power company has, doesn't have a power station on it. It has a child running through a field or something like that. Um, and uh, so we were, when, we were co when the consortium of engineers approached us and asked us to work with them on this power station, our condition was that we would work with them and that whatever we did, we were not going to just kind of decorate in a normal power station. And instead, we had to learn. We for kind of forced them to teach us. And so we spent time traveling with them and learning about all the different elements and finding that there were plenty of inefficiencies that weren't being capitalized on, that just taking a field and bunging all these things out isn't necessarily the most efficient way that they could work. So we looked at how we could compose all those elements instead of just litter, create one composition. And what we found was, I mean, this, this area is one of the poorest parts of Britain. It was voted the worst place in Britain to live. And there are 2,000 new homes being built next to this power station. So it felt this has a, a social dimension. It has a symbolic importance. And we should be proud of where our power is coming from, rather than something that we are necessarily ashamed of. So we were looking at how we could make a power station that instead of keeping people out and having a big fence around the outside, could be a place that pulls you in. And it's a, it has to be a, a, a 85, I'm trying to get my 250 foot high. Um, and so it felt that what we could try to do is make a power park and actually bring the whole area in. And using the spare soil that's there on the site, we could make a power station that was silent as well, because just that soil could make the acoustic difference. And we also found that we could make a more efficient structure and a, a cost-effective way of making a structure to do this. So the, the finished project is meant to be more than just a power station. It has a space where you could have a bar mitzvah at the top. <laughs> um, and uh, it's... It, but it's, it's, a, it's a power park, so people can come and really experience this and also look out uh, all around the area and use that height that we have to have for its function. In uh, Shanghai, we were invited to build uh, the... Well, we weren't invited. What am I talking about? We won the competition, and it was painful to get there. Um, uh, yeah, to, 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 so we won the competition to build the UK pavilion. And an expo is, is a totally bonkers thing. Uh, there's 250 pavilions. Um, it was the world's biggest ever expo that had ever happened, so there are up to a million people there every day. And 250 countries all competing, and the British government saying, you need to be in the top five. And so that, that became our, uh, the, the, go the governmental goal, is how do you stand out in this chaos, of, which is a, an expo, um, visual, of stimulus? And so we, our sense was that we had to do one thing, and, and that only one thing, instead of trying to have everything. So we, what we also felt was that whatever we did, we couldn't do a cheesy advert for Britain. <laughs> um, but the, the thing that was true, the expo was about the future of cities, and uh, particularly the Victorians pioneered integrating nature into cities. And the world's first public park of modern times was in Britain, and the world's first major botanical institution was, is in London. And they have this extraordinary project where they've been collecting 25% of all the world's plant species. So we suddenly realized that there was this thing, and everyone agrees that trees are beautiful, and I've never met anyone who says I don't like trees, and <laughs> the, the same with flowers. I've never met anyone who says I don't like flowers. But that we realized that seeds, there's this, been this very serious project happening, and, but seeds, at these major botanical gardens, there are, seeds aren't on show, and you, just have to, you have to go to a garden centre, and they're in little paper packets. But this, this phenomenal project's been happening, so we realised we had to make a project that would be seeds, some kind of seed cathedral. But how could we show these teeny-weeny things? And the, the film Jurassic Park actually really helped us, because the, the DNA of the dinosaur that was trapped in the amber gave us some kind of clue that these 
tiny things could be trapped and be made to seem precious rather than looking like nuts. Um, so the challenge was how are we going to bring light and expose these things? We didn't want to make a separate building and have separate content. So we're trying to think how could we make a whole, a whole thing emanate? Oh, by the way, we had half the budget of the other Western nations. So that was also in the mix with a, a, a site the size of a football pitch. And so there, there was one particular toy that gave us a clue. OK, you get the idea. So the idea was to take these 66,000 seeds that they agreed to give us and to take each seed and trap it in this precious optical hair and, and grow that through, through this box, very simple box element, uh, and make a, a building that could move in the wind. So the whole thing gently can move when the wind blows. And inside, the daylight, it's, each one is an optic and it brings light into the center. Um, and by night, artificial light in each one emanates and comes out to the outside. And to make the project affordable, we focused our energy, instead of building a big building as big as the football pitch, we focused it on this one element. And the government agreed to do that uh, and, and not do anything else and focus our energy on that. So the, the rest of the site, was a public space. And with that the million people there a day, it just felt like offering some public space. The, and we worked with an AstroTurf manufacturer to develop a, a mini-me version of the, of the seed cathedral. So that even if you're partially sighted, that it was kind of crunchy floor, and soft, that piece of landscape that you see there. And then, you know, when you go, uh, when people, when a pet has an operation and they shave a, a bit of the skin and get rid of the fur, they, in order to get you to go into the seed cathedral, in effect, we've shaved it, and inside, there's, there's nothing. There's no famous actor's voice, there's no projections, there's no televisions, there's no color changing, there's just silence and a cool temperature. Um, and if, you, if, a, if a cloud goes past, you can see a cloud on the tips with it letting the light through. This is the only project that we've done where um, the finished thing looked more like a rendering than our renderings. <laughs> a key thing was how people would interact. I mean, in a way, it was the most serious thing you could possibly do at the expo. Um, and I just wanted to show you, I mean, the British government I mean, any government is potentially the worst client in the world you could ever possibly want to have. And uh, th there was a lot of terror, and, um, but there was a kind of underlying support. And, that's, uh, and so there was a moment when suddenly, and the, the, actually the next thing, this, this is the head of UK Trade and Investment, <laughs> who was our client, um, were, with the Chinese children using the landscape. Sorry. I'm sorry about my stupid voice there. Um, the, uh, so finally, uh, texture is something. In the projects we've been working on, uh, the, these kind of slick buildings where they might be a fancy shape, but the materiality feels the same, is something that we've been trying to um, research, really, and explore alternatives. And the, the project that we're building in uh, Malaysia is uh, apartment buildings for a property developer, and it's in a piece of land, it's this, this site. And the, the mayor of Kuala Lumpur said that if this developer would give something that gave something back to the city, they would give them more gross floor area buildable. So there was an incentive for the developer to really try to think about what would be better for the city. And the conventional thing with apartment buildings in, in this part of the world is that you, you have your tower and you squeeze a few trees around the edge and you see cars parked. It's actually only the first couple of floors that you really experience. And the rest is just for postcards. The lowest value is actually the bottom part of a tower like this. So if we could chop that away and give a building a small bottom, we could take that bit and put it at the top where the greater commercial value is for a property developer. And by linking these together, 
we could have 90% of the site as a rainforest instead of only 10% of scrubby trees and bits of road around buildings. And so, oh. so we're, we're building these, these buildings. They're, they're actually identical, so it's quite cost effective. They're just chopped at different heights. But the key part is trying to give back an extraordinary piece of landscape rather than engulf it. And that's my final slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Thomas. You're a delight. Since we have an extra minute here, I thought perhaps you could tell us a little bit about these seeds, which maybe came from the shaved bit of the building. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are a few of the uh, tests we did when we were building the structure. So there were, there were 66,000 of these. This optic um, was 22 foot long, and so the daylight was just coming, was caught on the outside of the, the box and was coming down to illuminate each seed. And I mean, waterproofing the building was a bit crazy because normally it's quite hard to waterproof buildings anyway, but if you say you're going to drill 66,000 holes in it. Um, <laughs> it was quite a, uh, it was quite, we had quite a, a time. There was one person in the contractors who was the right size, and it wasn't a child, who could fit between them for, for the final waterproofing of the building. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs>